Hey everyone, today we're taking a look at the Microsoft Surface Pro 9. I'm really excited that I can finally talk about the Surface Pro 9 with you guys, because this is what the Surface Pro 8 should have been. And seeing as to how the Surface Pro 8 was already super good in a plethora of other departments, it goes without saying that things can only get better from here. At least, that's what you would expect, right? Let's talk about it. Previously on this channel, I reviewed the Surface Pro 8 and I said that there were three things that I wished were different about it, which had to do with the CPUs, the ports, and the keyboard. I wanted 12th gen Intel Core i5s and i7s, I wanted the port placements to go back to how they were like on the Surface Pro X, and I wanted the Surface Pro signature keyboards to be usable when detached from the Surface keyboard port. This generation, my top two wishes were granted, and I am extremely happy about that. You should be too. The Surface Pro 9 has 12th generation Intel Core CPUs and moves the placements of every port back to where they were on the Surface Pro X, same spacing and everything. This was all that the Surface Pro 8 needed in order to be perfect. I'm not too sure why Microsoft didn't just do these things from the start, but we have them now and it's an extremely big deal for this product, so we'll talk about that stuff in more detail in a second. But you would think that Microsoft would stop there, right? Like, this is the closest thing to the perfect Surface that we've ever gotten. So why touch anything else? Well, unfortunately, someone over at Microsoft doesn't seem to know when to leave things alone. Because we lost a very important port this generation. Although we still have the two Thunderbolt 4 ports, the Surface Connect port and the Surface Keyboard port on the Surface Pro 9, the 3.5mm headphone jack, the only dedicated audio I.O. port on this product line until now, is gone. And this is, this is such a, why did they do this? There's so much room in here for a headphone jack. See, I'm struggling to make words out of this situation because it's something that we shouldn't even be talking about in the first place. Like, come on Microsoft, it can't possibly be that hard to maintain the same port selection that you literally just had last generation. Your competitors don't even do this. Why go out of your way to make the port selection worse? You literally can't afford to be doing this, especially when products like the Asus ROG Flow Z13 exist. Like, I'm genuinely curious as to why anyone would think that this would be okay. We took two steps forward, one step backward, and now we have to waste time talking about the fact that this even happened in what would have otherwise been a near-perfect Surface Pro. But I guess a slightly better way to discuss the situation is to ask, who actually cares about this one step backward? Because look, I'm not too sure if I'm in a position to say that you can live without the headphone jack. In this very specific situation, you know yourself better than I do. If you need it, you need it. Either get an adapter or look into other laptops if you really need that port built in. It's that simple. Personally, I can live without it, but that's only because I have a workflow that can afford to live without it. Some people unfortunately just don't have that luxury. So now, this is going to be yet another reason why those people shouldn't get the new Surface Pro this generation. I don't think Microsoft's ecosystem is polished enough for them to pull stunts like this. Like, this isn't a smartphone or like a mid-tier tablet that we're talking about here. The Surface Pro 9 is one of the most versatile pieces of hardware in the market running a desktop class operating system. If anything, it needs more, not less. Never less. So they really can't afford to pull the same moves that Apple has been doing to their mobile devices. It doesn't matter if people who, quote unquote, can afford to live without the headphone jack exists, because the whole point of a versatile two-in-one computer like the Microsoft Surface Pro is to have as many things as possible available for whenever the user needs or wants those things. They don't have to be perfect, but it does just need to be there. You can't call something flexible if its flexibility is limited to begin with, so whoever made the decision to axe the headphone jack really messed up here. And keep this in mind, it's not hard to look for an alternative to the Surface Pro anymore, as the Surface Pro is no longer the only product with this sort of harmony between performance and form factor. In fact, many other products with this same form factor actually have better performance with a significantly better port selection than the Surface Pro 8. And I'm comparing it to the Pro 8, yes, not the 9 because the Surface Pro 8 has a better port selection than the Surface Pro 9 since we lost the headphone jack this year. 
So Microsoft really needs to stop messing around and at the very least, get the port selection back to how it was before, if not make it better. As long as the headphone jack returns in the next Surface Pro and Microsoft never pulls the stunt again, I'm pretty sure everyone would be willing to look past this one mishap because this is otherwise a very respectable device despite it having a minimal port selection. Microsoft has a lot of time to make that happen, but for right now, this is all we get. So the CPUs we're getting on the consumer line of Surface Pro 9 configurations are all 12th generation Intel Core CPUs, and these CPUs were what the Surface Pro 8 should have had from the start. They are so much better, even to the point where the Surface Pro 9 configured with a 12th gen i5 performs significantly better than the Surface Pro 8 configured with the 11th gen i7. Not only does the Surface Pro 9 score better than the Surface Pro 8 in some benchmarks, but it is also a performance gain that you can actually feel during extensive real-world use. And if you want to see that claim in numbers, it's best seen by comparing various benchmarking scores. Here are some Geekbench scores as a start. Now, all of this is definitely a lot less exciting once you remember that the 12th generation Intel Core CPUs are no longer considered current gen, since the 13th gen Intel Core CPUs are already here, and they're supposedly even better than the 12th generation of Intel Core CPUs when it comes to performance. But seeing as to how we're coming from the significantly less desirable 11th gen processors that the Surface Pro 8 had, this incremental upgrade to the 12th gen stuff is still a huge benefit. Yeah, sure, they're using last gen hardware again, but having Intel's 12th gen stuff in the Surface Pro 9 when we just came from, you know, garbage, <laughs> is a much bigger deal. So. Personally, that doesn't bother me too much, but they are still deserving of criticism for not using current gen hardware back when the Surface Pro 9 came out. 11th gen Intel CPUs were never really a good value in my opinion, especially when it came to the mobile CPUs that went into higher end laptops. But the 12th gen Intel CPUs were great performers and highly competitive from the very beginning, and actually still are. Even though the 12th gen stuff has gotten superseded already, I continue to consider laptops with 12th gen Intel CPUs when I'm looking around the market for something new, because they're just good CPUs. 12th gen Intel Core CPUs hold up very well. Once you put the competition into consideration, nobody was able to say the same thing for most of the 11th gen stuff, not even when that generation first came out. Not to throw shade at anyone in particular, but if you hear anyone say that the Surface Pro 8 performs better than the Surface Pro 9, either they got some benchmarks wrong or they just don't know what they're talking about. Maybe they forgot to update a driver or something while doing their comparison. Whatever. I made an hour-long full review of the Surface Pro 8 that you can watch right now and have extensively used both the Surface Pro 8 and 9 more than enough for everything that they are intended to be used for and beyond. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty sure that I have the experience and the credibility to dependably assert that the latter is not the inferior device when it comes to performance. Just saying. There is something a bit unusual in the performance department though, something we've never seen with any Surface Pro generation until now. So on the Surface Pro 9, Benchmarks between the i5 and the i7 configurations are extremely similar. Now, sometimes it's a little bit more clear that for certain prosumer level activities, the i7 is the better choice, especially when you're introducing graphics intensive activities into your workflow. But in many cases, the performance differences can appear quite negligible. And I thought this was strange at first because the i5 and the i7 configurations were never this close with previous Surface Pro generations in terms of performance. But once I started taking a deeper look into this, things made a lot more sense. This generation, both the i5 and the i7 configurations have 12 megabytes of L3 cache, as well as higher bandwidth LPDDR5 memory. And that combination alone largely improved performance, especially for all of the cheaper, quote unquote, lower end configurations. With previous Surface Pro generations, system RAM was much slower, and the lower end processors only had 8 megabytes of cache to work with rather than 12. So as a result of that combination, there would be a huge performance difference between the i5 and i7 configurations in those older Surface Pro generations. But now, the differences in performance are significantly less extreme, making the i5 configuration on the Surface Pro 9 a much more viable option for pretty much everyone. 
and that's not an exaggeration. If you've been thinking of getting a Surface Pro 9 but don't know what configuration to get, getting the Surface Pro 9 with the Intel Core i5, 16GB of RAM, and the 256GB SSD option seems to be the best value at the moment because, for one, it's not as expensive as the i7 models, obviously, but also it's not that far off from the performance of its higher tier i7 counterpart. In fact, if you think you'll be able to keep your Surface Pro 9 cold consistently, then the i5 configurations can actually outperform the i7 configurations easily. And if you ever feel like you'll need more storage, you can always upgrade the internal SSD yourself and save hundreds. Now that this configuration is out, I feel kind of bad for the people who bought the Surface Pro 8s at MSRP, but hey, sometimes people have their reasons for buying laptops right at launch. Just keep in mind that if you're looking into a Surface Pro right now and you care about real world performance at all, then you should be making every effort possible to get the Surface Pro 9 and not the Pro 8. All right, let's move on to talking about the ports. The port placements on the Surface Pro 9 have gone back to how they were on the Surface Pro X, and this was an extremely nice change. The two USB-C ports, which support Thunderbolt 4, are back on the left side, with the exact same port spacing as how it was with the USB-C ports on the Surface Pro X. The Surface Connect port remains on the same side, the right side, but it's no longer sitting near the bottom right corner of the device. It's been scooted up, which means that your Surface Connect cables should no longer bend a ton while the cable feeds straight downward. This was another thing that I've been asking for years, and Microsoft finally got around to moving that port up. I seriously appreciate this, and you guys should too. Do keep in mind that this isn't the first Surface Pro with Thunderbolt ports. Its predecessor, the Surface Pro 8, was actually the first Surface Pro to have Thunderbolt ports. And there were Thunderbolt 4 ports as well, not Thunderbolt 3. There's one more port, which is this single Surface keyboard port over here on the bottom, and that's about it for the port selection. Again, no headphone jack. Also, any Surface Pro keyboards that were made for the Surface Pro X and Surface Pro 8 are compatible with the Surface Pro 9. Keyboards made for the Surface Pro 7 Plus and earlier are not compatible. If that wasn't obvious already, now you know. There's also no micro SD card slot again this generation, but the internal SSD is still user accessible and user upgradable. And actually, the internal SSD is even more accessible this generation. They made it significantly easier to access. Before, with the Surface Pro 8, you needed a SIM eject tool, or like a paperclip or something, to remove the tray shielding the SSD. But this time, all you need is your finger to pop out the tray shielding the Surface Pro 9's internal storage drive. This is something I never really thought I needed. Microsoft didn't need to do this, but they did, and I really appreciate that. Here are some storage benchmarks for the two configurations I have here at home. It looks like drive speeds do vary between configurations again, like how it was with the Surface Pro 8. Lower tier configurations seem to have slower read and write speeds, but again, that can be changed pretty quickly by upgrading the SSD. I put my 1TB Kioxia BG4 SSD into my i5 configured Surface Pro 9, and now I'm pretty happy with my drive's performance. Another thing that's changed are the button placements on the Surface Pro 9. Both the power and volume buttons have been moved to the top left corner of the device, like how it used to be. And this was a surprisingly tasteful change to me. Before on the Surface Pro 8 and Surface Pro X, the power button was on the right side and the volume buttons were on the left side, which absolutely sucked for vertical storage. Because if you were to put the Surface Pro 8 or the Surface Pro X in your backpack vertically, or really any bag now that I think about it, then those buttons may accidentally get pressed, which was really annoying to me. And it didn't matter if it was in a laptop sleeve or something, because in that orientation, those buttons could still get pressed somehow, even with the slightest bit of force from the padding. With this new placement, accidental button presses have no longer been a thing for me at all. Like, there was a noticeable lack of moments where I found my Surface Pro 9 turned on when it should have been shut down. And that's a good thing, by the way. A very good thing. Alright, battery life. There's a simple answer for this, but also a much more complicated one. I'm gonna give you both answers, because I feel like the more complicated one isn't talked about nearly enough. The simple answer is this. If you're doing any sort of light to moderate amounts of work, then expect a minimum of 5-6 to six hours of battery life on average. Period. Now, if you're coming from a MacBook with Apple Silicon, then those numbers may sound absolutely bogus to you. But let's be considerate of two things. 
On OneNote, your usage may be different from mine. If the programs you use are efficient enough, or in other words, not as CPU nor GPU intensive as the ones that I use, then you can totally achieve longer battery life than what I'm getting. And on another note, if I really needed to, I could put in some effort into extending that battery life further, easily. It's not hard for me to get seven or eight hours of continuous screen on time if I know I'm going to need it. Not to mention achieving that can be done simply by using a lot of the battery saving features already built into Windows 11. I think nine hours is the absolute maximum I've gotten with this device with real usage. And that's with the refresh rate set to 120 Hertz, but I did do things like turn the brightness all the way down and make an effort to not use integrated graphics as much. So this is where the whole battery life discussion starts to get a bit complicated because I'm not joking when I say that it's not hard to get an actually decent amount of screen on time. It really isn't, but it's also not hard to eat up your battery on this thing. For example, if you do anything graphics intensive, your screen on time can get as low as one to two hours. And this is the same situation we had last year with the Surface Pro 8, but by now we should be familiar with this, right? So here's the thing. It's not hard to find laptops with better battery life than the Surface Pro 9, but don't dismiss the fact that the battery life you can get on the Surface Pro 9 is still very much usable. It's not something I would rave about, especially since Surface Pros have always had this trend since the Surface Pro 4 of averaging at like five or six hours of battery life depending on how you use them, but it's amazing that the Surface Pro product line has been able to steadily improve with each generation when it comes to performance and hardware capabilities without making the battery life worse than before. That, I think, is an extremely important observation to be considerate about. Sure, it could be better, but again, the battery life on the Surface Pro 9 is still not bad. Now, keep in mind that I'm talking about the Intel-configured Surface Pro 9s here. Everything I just said up until now regarding the battery life does not apply to the Surface Pro 9 configurations running on ARM. If you get the Surface Pro 9 configured with the Microsoft SQ3, which is an ARM-based processor, you can easily hit Microsoft's claim of 19 hours of quote-unquote typical device usage. I'm not joking. In fact, I've been able to stretch it out to over a day many times, which is obviously way over that 19-hour claim. Mind you, those were during the weekdays when I had college lectures back to back, plus lab sessions, plus homework. So I'm really using this thing. The Surface Pro 9 with the SQ3 really doesn't compare to the Intel-based configurations when it comes to battery life. However, that's a completely different architecture, which means a completely different use case for most people, that of which is another topic that could be discussed all by itself. But unfortunately, that ARM-based configuration isn't really the focus of today's video. It's the Intel-based one, so I don't want to hold you up on this conversation for too long. But do know that if the Surface Pro 9 is your dream device or something, and it's all you're considering, but you really need to prioritize battery life above all, then the configuration with the Microsoft SQ3 is definitely something you should look into. So yeah, that's pretty much everything you gotta know about the Surface Pro 9. Anything else that isn't new or changed was pretty much carried over from the Surface Pro 8. The cameras are still good, the microphones are still very good, the keyboard and trackpad are still great, albeit still sold separately and still pricey, also still no wireless capabilities. Charging times are about the same, still about two to two and a half hours for a full charge with the included charger. The speakers are still decent, still a stereo pair with one speaker on each shorter side of the device, and the display is still okay. Still approximately 450 nits with decent color accuracy and viewing angles, and still a 120Hz refresh rate that you should remember to turn on since you paid for it. Although, I do feel like it's about time for Microsoft to bring OLED displays to their products and also to use brighter displays. 450 nits is alright indoors, but if you have a window behind you or you step outside with the Surface Pro 9, the sun's gonna give you a really hard time with this display. Apple's been making the displays brighter on their MacBooks and iPad Pros, same with some other Windows laptops in the market. So I think it's about time for the display on the Surface Pro to get a meaningful upgrade as well. The note-taking and drawing experience with the Surface Slim Pen 2 is still the best on-screen pen experience you'll get on a Microsoft Surface. It still has 4096 levels of pressure sensitivity, still supports pen tilt functionality, and still has a programmable eraser button that can actually be used as an eraser. And don't forget that the eraser end is not pressure sensitive, unlike the actual pen tip of the Surface Slim Pen 2. 
If you watched my Surface Pro 8 review back when it came out, then you should already know this. Some reviewers have been saying that the eraser is pressure sensitive, but no, it is not pressure sensitive whatsoever. If you hear anyone saying that it is, please correct them, respectfully, as that is not true. I thought this would be common knowledge by now, since the eraser end of Surface Pens have been pressure sensitive since pretty much never, so it's quite unusual to me that there are still people getting this wrong. With that said, please keep that important piece of information in mind. The eraser end of the Surface Slim Pen 2 is not pressure sensitive. The haptics still feel like a bit of a gimmick in 2023, and the button placement could be better in my opinion, but we already talked about this last time in the Surface Pro 8's full review, so I don't want to waste too much time saying those same things over again. Check out my Surface Pro 8 review if you're interested, link in the description. But like I said, this is still a great active stylus, awesome for note taking and a lot more fun to use for drawing, especially in Windows 11 version 22H2. I did also want to talk about this new color on the Surface Pro 9 really quick, so let me just show you really quick. Look at this blue. This blue is absolutely stunning. I thought it was going to look kind of mid back when I ordered it, but I gambled and I chose blue anyway, and now I have no regrets. They call it sapphire on their product page, but for simplicity's sake, it's the quote unquote blue colorway. And this blue looks phenomenal. I will admit it's a lot lighter in person than I was hoping it would be, but the matching Surface Pro Signature keyboard is a lot darker and a lot more blue to make up for that. And because of this, I now find myself not too bothered by the lighter shade of blue on the actual Surface itself. I am a bit perplexed as to why the Sapphire, Forest, and Graphite colorways are only available on the Intel Evo configurations. I originally wanted to daily drive the configuration with the Microsoft SQ3 instead of an Intel Core i5, but they didn't have that in blue, so I'm a bit sad about that. Maybe they'll change that in the future though. Who knows? The Surface Pro 9 is definitely still a very interesting device to consider if you're looking for a premium and versatile Windows PC, especially now that this is over a year old at this point and has been seeing a lot of very tasteful discounts as a result of that. However, despite being a pretty decent product all around, it also leaves me with a lot of mixed feelings. Feelings that I've had since the day it came out, to be honest. The existence of this Surface, the Surface Pro 9, is a reminder that innovation and meaningful upgrades are an extremely important part of this product line's reputation. I love Microsoft Surfaces, and I want these products to do well, but there needs to be a push to deliver more meaningful upgrades and changes, because this generation, there was a bit too much of a lack of that, and it's pretty noticeable. The whole reason that the Surface family of devices are here in the first place is because they beautifully challenge what the personal computer should be to begin with. It does a good job at balancing a little bit of everything that makes both a laptop and a tablet great, and then harmonizes those things into a versatile form factor with a polished, well-engineered design and awe-inspiring build quality. This harmony between power, performance, versatility, and presentation is why people have continued to love the Surface Pro, despite its shortcomings. This, the Surface Pro 9, still has that harmony, don't get me wrong, but it hasn't been as strong as past Surface Pro generations have been around their respective times. And that's primarily because, let's be real, there's still a lot of room here for improvement. But unlike before, a lot of these improvements in question are no longer asking for too much. Now, it's simply more of an attempt to get the Surface Pro to match, or preferably even surpass, what a lot of the competition already has, such as OLED displays, brighter displays, significantly better battery life, lower latency pen input, a port selection that doesn't remove ports for no reason, and a lot more. I could seriously make that list go on and on, but you get the point. From here on out, I'm hoping to see more significant improvements and transformative changes that will keep the Surface Pro product line at the forefront of the 2-in-1 PC market. Because if we get to a point where all of this no longer feels like it's challenging the PC market, then people are going to stop looking into the Surface Pro as a viable option to help drive them forward. I still acknowledge the Surface Pro 9 as a decent product, because it still is one. It's a significant step in the right direction, thanks to a lot of the internal hardware upgrades we got this generation. They may seem small and insignificant, but as we discussed earlier, these upgrades really aren't 
insignificant. It addresses all of the major shortcomings of its predecessor, the Surface Pro 8, and tries to come a step closer to what many of us Surface fans have been longing for, thanks to a few other revisions that we've already talked about. Unfortunately, it's not without its own shortcomings. The removal of the headphone jack, though not a deal breaker for everyone, is a notable drawback that didn't need to happen. And on top of that, it's unfortunate to see the innovations promised alongside the Surface Pro 8 already seem to stagnate in this generation, most notably in the display and battery life departments. But thankfully, a lot of these more minor shortcomings have solutions to them. So as long as you're willing to put up with some of those shortcomings, I think you can still enjoy the Surface Pro 9 as much as I've been enjoying it. It's a versatile little companion that I've enjoyed using since the day I got it. It's just that in future generations, Microsoft needs to start being a lot more ambitious with this product line. My needs are increasing much faster than this product line is improving, and I know a lot of other people probably feel the same way. So when the new Surface Pro comes out, I'm going to be a lot tougher on it than ever before. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys again in my next video.